Um, so, uh, I am going to uh, introduce Ted, but first I'd just like to say, I think we have a birthday person with us today. Dove, is it not your birthday? It is your birthday, Dove Fishman's birthday. How great that we get to spend some of it. Here, you're muted. Let me see if I can have you unmute there. Hey, oh, no, it's not working. There you are. <laughs> oh, you just got muted out. Oh, let's try one more time. Okay, for whatever reason, it's not working. Okay. Well, we wish you a very happy birthday. I'm so glad you're here, my friend. Yes, beautiful. All right, I am going to introduce Ted, who many of you know quite well, and he needs no introduction. Uh, and uh, I'm very blessed to have Ted as a colleague, a friend, and a uh, very active leader in this Power of Love ministry. And uh, on his journey of 70 plus years, Ted has lived a full life that has included growing up on a farm, having a successful business, as well as going through bankruptcy, the loss of his wife, cancer, and living happily in a blended family with his current wife, Mary Ellen, and their six children, 18 grandchildren, and one great grand. Ted's the much-loved leader of our men's ministry at Power of Love Ministry, and he co-leads our bereavement support group. His rich life is filled with love, which has led him to be a prolific songwriter, having written hundreds of songs about love and loss. And I'm so glad you're here with us on this Mother's Day, Ted. Thank you so much. Yes, it's a great day it's a busy day and uh so definitely for all the mothers in attendance happy mother's day and for those that mothers have made a transition like my mother jennifer's mother um there's so many loving memories and things that uh come to mind on a day like this even in my 70s i still um Marcy's little boy and um after my mother passed I uh I I really I was doing a lot of bereavement uh, ministry work and I wrote this song by her for me but uh I share it with everyone because um uh, if your mother has passed, or even if she hasn't, you can. This song will still work. Uh, I'm gonna open with it. Through the day in the dark, while at work or in the park, always remember me loving you. When you laugh, when you cry, when you ask the good Lord why, always remember me loving you. The day will come, the pain will fade, in your walk in the sun. Praise the Father above, through the Spirit of love, we'll always be one. So when you wake Karen Slack or Sharon Slack. sleep, I pray the Lord your soul to keep. And always remember me loving you. One final prayer, my precious love, is that you know that I am here. Yes, praise the Father above, 
Through the spirit of love We will always be one So when you wake When you sleep I pray the Lord your soul to keep And always remember me Always remember me Always remember me Loving you Thank you. Thanks. Beautiful song, Ted. Beautiful, beautiful. Tell us, tell us something about your mom. Man, nine kids. She raised nine kids, and uh, she was in pain um, most of her life. She had when she was young. Ever seen big sand dunes? They have these big dunes in in Michigan. And uh, she ran out, thought she was going to be able to run out and jump and slide down these dunes. And she ran out and she landed on her back like this and broke her back on the sand dunes. Oh. It took forever for them to drag her up out of the sand dunes. Excruciating pain. And she had children. She worked um her butt off um and i just i she was in pain most of her life from that you know she had the back surgeries and all that and there were times yeah. that she would keep me home from school just to help her so that and uh but not complain wow just, yeah yeah did the laundry with the old wash machine with goes through the rollers and all that, hang them on the line with her with her back hanging with you know with clothespins, nine kids. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. People don't choose that life anymore. <laughs> yeah. But she's a good example. There was no uh you you could not complain. I mean, you could not complain because she got up early, got everybody off to work, everybody off to school. And then she worked herself. She cleaned offices. She did. She took in ironing. She she busted butt. Yeah, I learned a lot from her. I learned. I learned what a full day's work is. And if that's what's expected, that's what you do, and you don't moan about it. Right. Yeah, she, she was a good teacher that way. Yeah, when your survival and the survival of your loved ones depends on it, you don't moan about it. No, no. Yeah. And hopefully you're glad to help. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. That was fun to think about her. Yeah. Deb, would you like to share something? I see your hand up there. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for wishing me a happy birthday. And, you know, uh, I just couldn't turn it on then because I, I was trying to shut off a recording, but I truly appreciate it and wish everybody here the happiest Mother's Day for, for sure. And, Glad you're here. And I was born on Mother's Day, 1940. I, it was May 12th of 1940, and I was born at 9.06 p.m. <laughs> wow. All right. Wow. Thank you. That was that was eighty four years ago, right? Yes, doing doing great. Uh, yeah, keep on keeping on, my friend. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll come back to you later. Okay. Ah, yeah, beautiful. All right. So, you know. Um, I, I wrote about it in my daily shot of spiritual espresso today, and I made a video some years ago that I also shared in my shot of spiritual espresso today. I know a lot of you get my daily shot, and I had such a journey with my mother, such a journey, and um, I would say that 
one of the themes of my relationship with my mother when I was younger, when I was growing up, or most of our life together, uh, she died in 2008, you know, the body died, she laid the body down. And um, I was, I believe, 48 at the time when she passed away. And what colored a, a lot of our time together were a couple of themes. And one uh, certainly is and was that we love each other. We love each other. And we care about each other and we're important to each other and we value each other. And there was another theme that I feel like we both brought to it. You know, everything is a collaborative venture in this world. And uh, that is, she she had a very difficult time with her mother. Her father died when she was 15 and her mother was a challenging person. Her mother grew up in very difficult circumstances and it made her personality challenging, right? And, and who can relate to that? Having either it's you or it's other people in your life that the, the personality is very challenging. And if, if we're able to, we can look beyond that the per to the, per the personality. And I think one of the greatest gifts in this world is when we can love somebody regardless of their personality. I think that's one of the greatest things. And uh, certainly I experienced my grandmother's difficult personality. She also thought I was very, very special. So I got a lot of specialness from her, but some of the specialness I got from her was um, very codependent and manipulative and controlling and not fun. And, uh, but I, I for sure loved my grandmother, my mother's mother, um, unconditionally. And, but one of the things that my mother had with me was she was always concerned that I wouldn't like her because she loved her mother, but I don't think she liked her. My grandmother was hard on my mother, very disapproving, and um, could be at times cruel, publicly cruel, very argumentative and disapproving and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, my mother was valedictorian of her high school. She went to the University of Michigan. She was an honor student. She was, you know, very successful in many, many ways and married a wonderful man, my father. But they got married when my mother was a senior in college. And um, my my parents were like, it's okay, Gail. My, that's my mother's name, Gail. She's going to have a career. We're not going to start having children for years. You know, she really wants to establish her career. And one month later, I was on the way. <laughs> my grandmother was really not happy about that. and. Um, and so I really changed the trajectory of their life. Of course, I didn't I, I didn't know I was involved in the planning, but perhaps I was. Who knows about these things? Anyway, um, so my mother had this fear that I, and she told me many times that she was afraid that I would dislike her the way she disliked her mother, or that she would uh, somehow make me not like her. And of course, because she held that in front of her mind so much of the time, um, in a lot of ways, I didn't like my mother. And I, I know I was just carrying her energetic, I know this now, I was carrying her energetic of not loving herself and feeling unworthy. And uh, she would do things that would uh, bother me. And you know how it is sometimes people can't seem to help it they're so afraid you won't like them that they do things that are off-putting and i frequently felt disappointed with my mother she didn't know how to braid my hair 
and she didn't know how to teach me about makeup and she didn't she wasn't cool or fun in the ways I wanted her to be cool and fun now of course I could see that my mother was a brilliant forward thinking amazing woman and uh, as I got older and I would invite uh, my friends to visit my parents with me uh, and I got into my 30s and 40s and people would have a chance to spend time with my mother and talk with my mother and they'd come away and they'd be like your mother's amazing she's amazing I like her so much and I'm like yeah you get to see a different woman than I do but um she was amazing. She was right there at the beginning of Head Start, that amazing program that has helped so many families over the decades. She was a, 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 a social activist in the uh, civil rights movement, very involved in that, along with my father. And she was very uh, in the very involved in the um they called it the anti-war movement then about Vietnam. And I can remember doing a Mother's Day march for peace with my mother in the town we lived in, carrying signs and all of that on Mother's Day. And uh, she had a consciousness raising group that met every month. And she, she had a lot going on. And she really worked a lot of her life in social services and particularly working with poor families. And um, she gave a lot, she gave a lot to this world. And, and she had a good marriage with my father, which was also wonderful for me to have growing up. And, and still, I felt disappointed with her a lot of the time that she wasn't the person I wanted her to be. And, I like I said, I, I think that was also related to her projection uh, and me picking it up. And that's one of the things that we do in this world. We project our fears onto people and then they demonstrate that our fears are real. That's how it looks. That's how it seems. And yet it's it's not the truth of things. It's not how things really are. Um, but very often uh, when uh, I know when I was a teenager and I, I could be so sarcastic, I could be so mean. And one of the things that was a, a constant pattern in my relationship with my mother was I would disapprove of her. I would show my disappointment and I would be sarcastic. And I didn't know it at all at the time, but I felt so guilty for doing that. I didn't know it. I thought I was just angry at her, but actually I was really angry that she allowed it, that she didn't make me stop that she didn't have that boundary to say that's completely unacceptable. I will not tolerate that from you. And I, I wanted to be able to find where she wouldn't take it anymore. And so I would push and push. And um, I think that's definitely a spiritually immature aspect of some people's personalities that they push and push and push looking for the boundaries. All children do that, but hopefully they can find them. And I did find them in many ways when I was growing up. But in turn, when I became a teenager, my mother started to tolerate my sarcasm and my eye rolling and my huffing and puffing and all of that, dismissing her, uh, looking down on her and uh, criticizing her and I just didn't know I was looking for the boundary. And she didn't know that either. I, she didn't know that either. In a sense, I became like her mother to her. I was like recreating patterns 
that she had from her mother with her. So her mother would display her disappointment with her. I would display my disappointment with her. And I'm sure all of that was very, very, very hard on my mother. I'm glad she had the support of my loving father through all of that. And I also was disappointed that my father didn't make me stop too. And so I learned a lot from all of that. And I came to A Course in Miracles around the time that my mother got a terminal cancer diagnosis. And it was divine timing for sure. Now I was already a science of mind minister practitioner uh, just around the time that I started with A Course in Miracles back in 2006. Uh, I, I started practicing A Course in Miracles simply by this. It was, it was actually, I made the decision in 2006 to make being loving the most important thing in my life. I, I decided that was my intention for that year. I always set an intention for the year to just be loving, no matter what was my intention for 2006. I'm just going to be loving no matter what. Because when you do something like that, you have an intention for the year and you just make the whole year about that, then every day you can be successful to some degree. Every day you can be successful. So in 2006, it was to just be loving. And let me just say that that kicked my butt big time, totally kicked my butt big time, being attempting to be loving all the time, no matter what. And, but it was in that period when my mom got this diagnosis. And so when she got that diagnosis, I made the decision that she was not going to leave this planet until we were 100% in a loving, good, happy, holy relationship. That And I knew it was totally 100% on me. It was not up to her. It was up to me. I am responsible for what I see, and I choose the feelings I would have. And... I do not feel guilty because the Holy Spirit will undo all the consequences of my unbelievable number of wrong decisions, like this million wrong decisions. The Holy Spirit will undo the consequences of every single wrong decision I ever made. And so I put my full faith and trust to the best of my ability in the Holy Spirit. And in practicing non-judgment, because I did realize I had been teaching forgiveness for a few years at that point. Uh, I started teaching him for forgiveness in 2000. And I had learned that if you don't judge, there's nothing to forgive. If you don't criticize and judge and condemn, there's nothing to forgive. If you don't interpret things and make meaning of things that are judgments and criticisms and complaints there's nothing to forgive so to live a life without anything ever to forgive is totally within our power i knew that but i didn't have until that moment that i heard about that diagnosis i didn't have the impetus to put the pedal to the metal and to truly go for it. Until that moment, I was like, eh, I'm doing the best I can, eh, you know. But the ticking clock of my mother's terminal diagnosis put the fire under me. And I just was like, Holy Spirit, I am not letting her die. Uh, you know, I'm not letting her leave this planet. I am not, I am not until we are 100% at peace. That's how I thought about it, 100% at peace nothing but love. And that is what happened. That is what happened. And 
there were many times that I I would be with my mother and I would be visiting my parents and I would take a, a break and I'd go in the bedroom and shut the door and I would get down on my knees and I would say to the Holy Spirit, I will not think these thoughts. I will not think these thoughts. I will not think these thoughts. I will not say these thoughts. I will not communicate these thoughts. These thoughts are not my thoughts. I won't have them. I don't want them. They have nothing to do with me. I am a creature of love and light. And that is the only thing I'm interested in. That is the only focus that I have. These thoughts are nothing and they are no part of me. Take them out of my mind so I never think them again. I am done with them. And I literally would do that. Shut the door, get down on my knees and say that and pray and pray and pray to let them go. And the thing is, we, we've all experienced this. We have that contrition, that prayer, that desperate feeling of, oh my God, why do I keep thinking these thoughts? I don't want them. I don't want them. And we feel like our, our consciousness, our mind, our awareness is we're a victim of our thoughts, right? We're a victim of the thoughts we're thinking. We're a victim. We can't seem to get out from under the negativity, the complaints, the thoughts of revenge and attack and not enough, et cetera. And what I learned is that it's true. I've certainly learned everything in A Course in Miracles is true. You know, um, I don't know anything about Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford or what I know I could put in one paragraph that is I, I never made it my business to study them though perhaps that would be very interesting I'm not saying you shouldn't or anything I just I, I'm so content with the book itself I'm, I'm really just I, I don't need to look beyond it I haven't read Ken Wapnick's books or any of that stuff um, but what I I know to be true in the course is that our willingness is the only requirement. There's not one other requirement because we are part of God. We are not abandoned. We are not on our own. We don't have to do it for ourselves ever, 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 unless we want to. And then good luck with that, you know? You know, knock yourself out. If you want to do it by yourself, spend the next rest of your life doing it for yourself, have fun. Enjoy it if you can. But the truth is we have a level of support and love and intelligence that is available to us that is from the ego identified self incomprehensible. The amount of love and support and intelligence that is available to us in every second and in every cell of our body temple, in every relationship, in every part and particle of our life, it's incomprehensible from the ego perspective. And that love, that support, that intelligence that is always available, always for us, only needs our willingness. Because this world and this experience is about, we've made it this way, it's about, would you like to be on your own or would you like to be united? It's just... Think of it like a video game about what do you what do you want? You want to be united or you want to be on your own? You choose, and whatever you choose, you get to experience. So if you do not wish to experience being alone and feeling unsupported, stop choosing it. That's all you have to do, you know? <laughs> I must have made a wrong decision because I'm not at peace. Oh, okay. I made the wrong decision. 
and we don't have to remember where we made the wrong decision or what was happening when we made the wrong decision. It's just, we don't feel at peace, go the other way. Just, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. So that's what I did with my mom. I became more willing than I'd ever been before. Didn't happen overnight, but it got to a greater and greater willingness. And once you develop some willingness, you can start to, if you'd like to, tap into a true deep desire, a yearning. Not in, a, not in an ego human yearning, but it's like, have you ever seen a, a drops of rainwater, let's say, on, on a pane of glass? And they're separate. They look separate. But then they seem to magnetically come together, right? And more water, drops join and more drops join and becomes a little stream, right? So there's that magnetic attraction that the drops have for each other. That's the truth about us. We have a magnetic desire to remember the unity and oneness of all life. And, so, and our willingness is all that's required for us to remember it. Because there's no way to have an intellectual approach to remembering the unity of all life. There's no way. You can't have a, a, an intellectual approach. I know because I really tried to. I really did. I gave it my best. And it just didn't work. But when I moved into the deep desire of my heart is to know myself as God and to see my brothers and sisters as God too. When I moved into that as the yearning of my desire, then I got there. Then I had that, that willingness that I, I didn't have to cultivate it anymore. It was there. It was a burning, churning yearning desire to remember the truth, to love the truth, to value the truth. Because the truth, we, you know, we know that uh, saying, the truth sets us free. So many sayings are true because they are reality with the capital R. And uh, other sayings are not true. Um, they've just been repeated so often. We think they're true, like time heals all wounds. No, does not, you know. But um, love does. Love does. Love does. So I made it my intention to have this healing with my mother, and we did. We did. And it was miraculous and wonderful. And we got to spend the last few months of her life in that perfect symbiotic love relationship because she really was um, bed bound at that point. And um, I got to care for her just like when I was a baby and I couldn't get around on my own and she would carry me and and take care of my body. I got to do that for my mother uh, at the end of her life. And we had just these wonderful symbiotic times at times when um, I might be massaging her arms or her legs and things like that. And, and she and I would just be gazing at each other the way mothers and children do right? Mothers and babies do. Only we were both adults and um, we didn't need to say anything. We were just symbiotic love gazing. And I, in those times of conversations, it was winter. And I remember so much just sitting beside her and having conversations about various things. Uh, and and asking her questions like, do you have any regrets, mom? Um, is there anything that uh, still bothers you about our relationship? Is there anything that um, you want to bring up? Um, 
You know, it was really wonderful because, and I encourage you, those of you who can, if you have loved ones who are later in life, then you can have these honest conversations with them. Take the Holy Spirit with you. You will never regret it. You'll never regret it. But do take the Holy Spirit with you. Take the angels with you. At that point, I, I felt so connected to everything, everywhere, all the time. I, I didn't have to think about it so much anymore. But um, I, I did say, Mom, is there anything that you're holding against me? Anything like that that we could talk about? And she said, no, dear. She says, is there anything you're holding against me? I said, no, none of that is, it's not real. It's not important. And it's all over with now. I, I don't have any of those feelings anymore. And she knew I was telling the truth. I knew she was telling the truth. And one of the beautiful things, a couple of years before she passed away, because um, she had three years after that initial diagnosis, almost three years. Um, I remember at one point something happened with some people in her life and I thought, oh, that's kind of not, not nice. And I said, I asked her about it and she said, like, is she judging them? And she said, oh, I don't have time for that anymore. I don't have time for that anymore. No more. She really, she did a good job there the last few years. She really did. She, I never heard her complain. She would remark sometimes like, can you believe what's happening to my body? And the things that went on were sometimes like out of a horror movie. Um, but I never heard her complain about any of it, even the pain and the discomfort. She just didn't complain about it. And um, that that to me was not how my mother used to be. And so she really had, she really developed a lot of, growth in those last couple of years. And I had some things that went on like um, early on in the journey of that illness with her. I remember she would want to have a piece of cake. She had a sweet tooth. She'd want to have some chocolate. She liked chocolate. And, uh, or she'd want to have uh, scotch on the rocks. You know, and in my mind, I think, well, all that's just sugar. It's just going to feed that cancer. And in my mind, I thought, oh, you'd rather have the scotch than have another year with me. You'd rather have the cake or the chocolate than have another year with me. You know, you've got no self-control. You don't care. You know, just <laughs> so um, I. I'm so glad that during that time, I came to see like my own cravings and self-medication and things like that. I started to have a a, a recognition of like, well, girl, you you you're, you shouldn't be having another glass of wine. That's not a good idea, but you're doing it just like she's having that piece of cake. You know, she she wants to tune out. She wants to have the scotch she wants to enjoy the pleasure of the chocolate just like you'd like to have those potato chips and you'd like to have you know whatever it is you'd like to have why can't she you know what's so bad about it is it so horrible but I always made it about or not always but during that time I realized I had been making it about whether or not she loved me you love the cake more than you love me that's what I the equation I made in my mind so it was a great teacher to me. I started to really become conscious of all these equations that we make in life. You know, it's the interpretations. I've given everything all the meaning that in the that it has for me. I'm responsible for what I see and what I think and what I feel. And nothing happens in this world that I don't wish for. You know, that's that's so hard to comprehend. It's so hard to accept until we just say, ah, screw it. I'm going to accept it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, okay, that's true. And I'm going to live by the light of the truth. So during that time with my mother, I, I, I gave up a lot of my resistance to the truth. 
I really did. And I really moved into acceptance that we are all one, that death is not real, only love is real, that we are eternal beings and that we are perfect love. And the beauty is that I also know, because I've worked with so many people, that even if your loved ones aren't walking around on the planet anymore, you can still do the forgiveness work with them and it works. And what I have witnessed is that the people who have lots and lots of sadness and tears about their loved ones who've moved on or uh, that they have a challenge with, it's often related to guilt. It's often related to guilt. I think one of the hardest things that anybody ever goes through in this world is when they have a difficult relationship with somebody that's very important to them, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a spouse, a child, and that person suddenly passes away and they never get to say to them, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me, thank you. They never get to say that to their face. And there's so, so, so much guilt. So what I, I learned from my experience with my mother was all the things that I thought I was mad at her for, I was just mad at myself for. And I was guilty for, I felt guilty, not that I was guilty, I felt guilty for not being more loving with her. I forgave myself for that, for real. And then I wasn't mad at her anymore. There was no more anger at all. It was 100% gone. And that has really convinced me that sharing this forgiveness work is the most important thing I can do. Inspiring people to do the forgiveness work for real. And so many miracles have come from it. So at one point in my mom's final months there, she said, because she, you know, the conversation had come to some regrets. And she said, your sister-in-law is such a good mom. I wish I could have been a better mom. And I said, oh, mom, you're the perfect mom for me. You couldn't have been a better mom for me. And I meant it 100%. I wasn't just blowing smoke. I really, really meant it. And she knew I meant it. And she knew it was true. Couldn't get there without forgiving myself. And because of giving up that guilt, I gave up most of the blocks to love. And that opened my heart in such a way that that 2006 intention to just be loving really became manifest for me. Not that I'm 100%, not claiming that. There are times when I'm not 100%, that's true. But even when there are times when I'm not 100% loving with myself or other people, in pretty short order, I'm back again. And I can be loving with myself for not having been loving with myself five minutes ago. I can be loving with myself now for not having been loving with somebody else 10 minutes ago. And that's freedom. That's freedom. And I would say that there's probably not a mother on the planet who's in their right mind that wouldn't say what they wish for their children is love and freedom. Those are gifts that we give ourselves. And when we do, then we can share them with others. And the love of God is what we are. 
we are perfect love already and we can't be any more perfect. So let's place our hands on our hearts right here and right now. And let's declare that this is a holy and sacred time and that we are in a vortex of healing and we are calling upon the divine mother and all the mothers and all the motherly love that ever was. And we are opening ourselves to a full and complete healing back to the root cause of any attachment to being unloving or unloved any attachments we have to thinking ourselves unworthy or guilty or shameful or not enough. We're giving all of the root causes of it to the divine mother, to the holy mother. We call upon all the great mothers from the visible and the invisible to support this healing right here, right now. We are cultivating the willingness and that is all that is required. We are willing to see ourselves and everyone else as worthy of love, as innocent. Taking some deep breaths here, we open ourselves to this healing. And just seeing it ripple out from our heart all around the world including everyone, everywhere, including all the world leaders and all the soldiers and all the military and everyone everywhere who might feel unworthy, unlovable, to all the rich people and all the poor people, everyone, everywhere. Basking in this field of love. And because we are one with everyone, on behalf of everyone, we invoke that higher Holy Spirit self to undo all the consequences of every wrong decision we have ever made or thought of making. And we open ourselves to the love, letting the love flow in our awareness, in our heart and mind. Love renews, restores, refreshes. Deep breathing as we're revitalizing. Restoring. So grateful and so thankful to let this healing be fully realized, to ripple out, to be made manifest. We let it be, and so it is. Amen. 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 And as we're sitting in this space, I invite uh, Ted to please give us another song. to live 
I live to love And I like to feel the warmth Of the morning sun I like to laugh Laugh till I cry Yes, I'd like to be a kite In that morning sky But should this be my final day let it end in thanks and praise For love is all that I need For all that I am All that I can be All that I am is love For all our love's gifts All is love's grace And all is here to sing love's praise For all are your gifts All is your grace And all is here to sing Your praise So oh, perfect, Ted. Wow. Feel your heart so much. Thank you. Yeah, very beautiful, very touching. Mm. Thank you so much, Ted. All right, let's see here. Uh, I am going to start us into a breakout. So that's what we do here on Sundays with Spirit. We go into a breakout so everybody can share just for a couple of minutes, not a long share. You won't have much time. But if you'd like to share anything that moves you from the inspiration in the talk or the, the music, I invite you to share with your breakout partners and uh just the one request I have is to make sure that everybody who would like to share gets to share if they would like to. So I'm going to open these rooms right here and uh, let's have a healing conversation. Here we go. So. Let's see. Uh, if you can't find your breakout room, you should see it on the bottom bar. You should see it on the bottom bar if you can't find your breakout room. All right. So I've got Dove and Ted with me in my breakout, and we're on Facebook Live. And Dove, would you like to share something about your mom? Can you get yourself unmuted there? Yes, yeah, I would like to share something about my mom. I also had two thoughts about your sharing on your mom as well. But l let me start with my mom. <clears throat> my mom... I was five years old when my oldest brother, who was then 19, was killed in action in World War II. And she never was the same after that. I mean, you know, she literally lived the rest of her life, which was literally another 34 years, 
uh, asking God, why did he do this? Why did he take her son from her? So she, she, most of her life, at least the part that I know, was sad. I I, I know her before uh, in her 20s and 30s. She was really a, a really lovely, laughing woman. And then that happened and she was never the same. Uh, but she taught me everything I know spiritual. I mean, she used to stand in her kit, you know, like on the high ho holy days, my father went to synagogue. She stayed at home in the kitchen, cooking, whatever. And uh, I once asked her, why don't you go too? And she said, no, I don't have to go to a building to talk to God. I always talk to God exactly where I am. And she used to talk to God in her kitchen. And I think that that's what kind of gave me my 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 spiritual roots, really, in, in a way. Uh, later, she got dementia, which uh, people think is is not good. I think in her case, it was it was really uh, a grace of God that that she didn't have to think about the things, and, and, and she didn't even really know my name, so she certainly forgot, you know, the rest of the things that she used to dread. Uh, if I can share two things on, on what, you, what you said, both the, the, the amazing thing is that we choose our parents. As it says in chapter 29, section four, uh, dream roles, uh, whatever happened, you know, happened because you asked for it and you received it because it was a lesson you came here for. Uh, there's a guy named Rob Schwartz who wrote a book called The Plan of the Soul. And and he does a lot of work with people who are in the Course of Miracles, uh, especially groups, people in my group at ACM Gather. He actually came as a guest speaker. Uh, uh, he, he, he talks about pre-birth planning, which is really how... Do, how well, how do we pick and choose the people in our life? Well, we assign to them the roles that we needed to have them in our life for us to learn the lessons that we came here for. And the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Richard Bach, who uh, most most people know, Jonathan Livingston, Seagull, uh, a lot of other books like The Illusion or Illusions. He wrote a book very few people know about called There's No Such Place as Far Away. And he says, no matter if a person is here or departed and, and, you, and, and you're nowhere near them, whether they're here in body or not in body, you can speak to them by bringing them into the center of your mind and you can actually tell them whatever it is that's in your heart. I just wanted to share that. Yes, true, because each and one, every one of us is a non-local event, right? That's what the quantum physics physicists say. We're a non-local event. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful, Dove. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm going to come back to you. Ted, anything you would like to share that uh, came up? Well, I find that Mother's Day has always um, has always been for me um, something to you know go to. Um, I'm going to show you a picture here, real quick. My mom got to stand up for a wedding, in in and. Uh, and she didn't she didn't have money she wasn't a glamour person but this was the one time that she got to dress up to be a brides one of the bridesmaids and this is i don't know have little reflections but she was oh. yeah and it was this was in detroit and um this is one of the things only picture that we have of her really you know what i would consider glamour dressed you know what right. I'm saying? Yeah. and and i know raising the children that she did that that was that was just like outside of the realm of her 
of her existence. And uh, so I keep that this picture out because beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Yeah. Miss you, Mom. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You know, moms are a journey. Moms are a journey. I never, I haven't had any children. It's unlikely that I would have any at this point. I'm 64. And um, I, uh, I just have such a deep appreciation of moms. It's amazing how uh, many people have had challenging relationships with their moms and many moms have had challenging relationships with their children. It's, it's uh, one of the ways that we work stuff out. Yeah. And I, I can't say enough about just relying completely on the Holy Spirit. That has been the thing that really worked for me. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Anything else from you, Doug? No. Uh, yeah. Uh, just feel great. That's all. So since it's your birthday, do you do anything um, like, do you set an intention for your year or anything like that? Well, I really don't plan. Uh, that's part of my thing. And, you know, like lesson 135, <laughs> lesson, uh, paragraph 7 to uh, paragraphs 11 to 17 say, a healed mind doesn't plan, receives wisdom from above and then finally in uh, paragraph 18 my favorite paragraph what can you not accept if you've been new that everything that happens so I'm, I'm really into acceptance you know I, acceptance is really where I, I live you know yeah that's where the peace is mm -hmm. yeah you, you know you know my first teacher before I ever heard of the course, in 75, and, and a year out in California, I think, originally, uh, was Werner Earhart and S. I took S in 75. Uh, and if I didn't take S in 75, I would never have picked up the course when I found it in 77. Uh, and I just happened to see some quotes from from uh, Werner Earhart, and he actually, one of his quotes is, happiness is acceptance. <laughs> That's from Werner Earhart. And by the way, you mentioned you never really read too much of Ken Wapnick. I wanted to say to you, I wanted to say to you, uh, I, I have compiled over almost 60 quotes from Ken Wapnick, and I've been sending them to people. I'd be glad to send you uh, a, a copy of the 60 quotes. Yeah, and, please do. Yeah, and, and they're really great quotes, because for me, Ken, Ken, Ken was my teacher, still is. As it happened that they see him gather, they they actually play Ken Wapnick tapes uh, recordings, his uh, workshops every morning, Monday through Saturday, six at uh, six days a week from around five thirty to eight thirty nine. So I've been listening to him for years. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I find these quotes that you can't find anywhere else that 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 he says, and I keep adding to them. So I'll be glad to send it to you. Oh, that's wonderful. I would appreciate that. Thank you, Dove. Um, let's remind people how to join ACIM Gather. Uh, it's, well, it's acimgather.com. You just go there. And and, and basically, it, it, uh, uh, there's a schedule on the left. And the schedule is uh, who all the teachers are Monday through Sunday. Uh, and, and there's a radio station on the top of the website. And if you click that radio station, you're actually listening 
to what's going on at ACM Gather. So you go there uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, you listen to Ken Wapnick, and on Sunday the, the, they are the, they're playing another another teacher who 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 used to, who was a student of Ken who started teaching in in Dallas. Uh, so it's very easy. Yes, ACM Gather. Oh, Jennifer. Oh, did oh, oh did you put the thing there? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay, asmgather.us is perfect, yeah. And there's one other question I have for you. I've I've asked this several times, by the way. I want to make a donation. Can I donate using Cash App? Yes, I, I will send you that information. I just, I'm sorry, I I keep forgetting to do it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and... And I'll put it on our website too, in case anybody else is interested. Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so folks are going to come back from the breakout in about thirty seconds. And uh, any further thoughts from you, Ted? I just, uh, I just appreciate this opportunity to to come and share this music. It'd just be sitting on a shelf. So, as always, thank you. Well, gosh, we love it. We love it so much. Thank you. All right, here they come. Here they come from the breakout. Give me one second here. Uh, how was the breakout? Was the breakout good? Helpful? Good to... Great. Yeah. I'd love to know if people would like to put into the chat and I can energize it. Uh, what are you taking away? What are you taking away from today so far? Uh, let's, let's give that some energy and attention. I always find that helpful when I can write things down or share it with another person. So right now we're gonna make a few quick announcements and then Ted's gonna give us another song. I'll close us out with a prayer and we'll go on our way. So uh, announcements, I'm going to put the power of love ministry.net website into uh, our chat here. And you can uh, go here to make a donation. You can go here to um, get all of our classes. I have coming up, uh, as many of you know, uh, starting next Friday, uh, sorry, Saturday, I'm flying on Friday, um, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, I am leading a week-long training that starts on Saturday the 18th uh, for spiritual counseling, quantum counseling training intensive. It's open to anyone and everyone. People come just to have a healing. People come because they'd like to be counselors or they're already therapists and they'd like to have a more spiritual approach. Uh, people come because they're lawyers, accountants, and people who work with clients and they'd like to have better, better client uh, care and listening and increased intuition, all kinds of reasons why people come. And then uh, the following weekend, Memorial Day weekend, we're doing the how to create and lead workshops that make a difference. And a lot of counselors like to do workshops. So that's why I do them back to back. Certainly, I can say that Truly, some of the greatest healing I've had at the level of the mind came from sitting with clients and practicing this presence of God and opening to intuition and inspiration and sitting with clients, sitting with someone who was going through something. It really uh, put the impetus to truly be that loving presence of God with them. And so it's been deeply, deeply, deeply healing for me. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so that's why I love to teach people for counseling. 
And I, again, we've got Dove Fishman here. It's his birthday. And Dove is a counselor as well. Dove, why don't you put in the chat and uh, you can also unmute and tell us how, if people would like to do counseling with you, how would they do that? Okay. First of all, the very first session is always free, just so we get to see each other, to know each other. And we always really look at people's lives because I have a card that actually says, uh, be grateful for your triggers. And your triggers are the things that upset you. So the things that, that make you upset, angry, afraid, worry, stress, all those things that you feel anxious about in life are your lessons. And your lessons don't come from the people that you love and, 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 they, and they love you. They come from the people that you can't get along with because it says, be grateful for your triggers for they reveal our mistaken beliefs. And the word belief has a lie in it. So, so, so the ego is believing in, a, in, in, a, in something that, that is a blockage or something that, that separates me from this other person. And that's why I get upset because it reminds me of my own guilt. There's, there, there, there's a separation there. So that's what we talk about. And it's, it's easy to talk to me. I, I'll put my phone number up if that's okay. And I'm reachable by uh, phone. Uh, call me always. It's easy to call me by, by, by phone. 914-282-4455. And the first session is usually 45 minutes to an hour. And we get to know each other. And, and we talk about some of the things that bother you. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, Dove, I know you're very active on Facebook, so people can also find you on Facebook. Yeah, on Facebook, I'm I'm under David Fishman and also Dove Fishman. I have a I have a few different uh, because you can only have five thousand friends, so I do have three or four profiles. Hmm. I think you know you can now combine those all and. We could yeah, help you. I, I know. I, I've never done it. Yeah. Well, if you'd ever like help with that, we can help yeah. you. With that. I'm also on TikTok, by the way, under under Dove Peace, D O V P E A C E, and I really spend much more time on Dove Peace on TikTok than I do on Facebook these days. I know you're on TikTok every day. It seems like. Yeah, I I, I try and do at least one posting a day. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I see you're in my feed every day. Yeah. I, I I watch TikTok when I'm brushing my teeth at night. I love it. Yeah, so you're always there with something. I appreciate you, Dove. Love you so much. Happy birthday. Yeah. That's yeah. That's Dove peace. Good luck. I muted you out, Dove. Sorry. I thought we were done. All right, we're gonna go to a song with Ted. And uh, and then I'm going to say a prayer and we will be done. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone that, that's here. It's wonderful to have a place to come uh, and to talk about love because uh, we need to do more of it. There's a need to talk about it Though some have climbed mountains and shouted Love mm -hmm. Let's talk about love For no matter what we do before this life on earth is through We'll need to face love Men let pride get in their way Caught up in living every day Too busy to stop and think 
what this life is about making a living climb to the top have life's true fortune if they'd only stop take the time give and take love for no matter what we do before this life on earth is through we need to face love yes there's a need to talk about it though some have climbed mountains and shouted love about love for no matter what we do before this life on earth is through we need to face love we need to face love Oh, Ted, that's so beautiful, so perfect for our Mother's Day celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, all right, let's pray. Very grateful, very thankful for the love of God that shines so powerfully in our hearts and minds. So grateful and thankful for the peace of God that is awake and alive within us. We are grateful and thankful to come together this Mother's Day to leave the past behind, to stand in the light of love, knowing that love is what we are. We are willing to see our mothers, our fathers, and every other being as the love that they are. We are grateful to give up the illusions and delusions and to go forward revived, revitalized by the love that we are. So grateful and thankful to give to the Holy Spirit anything that no longer serves our walk of love, our path of love. We are truly grateful for the opportunities that we have to be the love in our life, in this world. We are so grateful to share the benefits with everyone. We let it be, and so it is. Amen, amen, amen. Ah, thank you. Happy Mother's Day. God bless. Bye for now.